Welcome to Lesson 19, Numerical Solution Using MATLAB. We're going to look at the same problem with the mass and spring that we did in the previous lesson, but instead of using the Laplace transform to solve the initial value problem, we will replace it by difference, a difference equation, a finite difference equation. And we'll find out that to do that, we will use a formula such as this, for approximating f prime of t, the first derivative, and a formula such as this for approximating f double prime of t. Here's a roadmap of this lesson. We will consider the same mass spring initial value problem as in the previous lecture. In that problem, the external force was periodic. In the previous lecture, we used the Laplace transform of a periodic function to help solve the problem. In the present lecture, we will not use the Laplace transform. Instead, we will use a finite difference equation to approximate the ordinary differential equation. We will set it up so as to satisfy the initial conditions, and then we will use actually octave, which is about 90% compatible with MATLAB. The code will be, I think, probably the same in both. Uh, to plot the approximate solution and compare it to the analytical solution that we got last time using the Laplace transform. So here's the problem. Uh, this is the spring and mass system. Uh, a wall over here, the spring stretched or compressed perhaps, a mass m here. Um, there's a restoring force due to the spring given by Hooke's law. We have a force due to frictional drag. This mass and spring might be going through a fluid, and that would involve then some drag. Uh, we'll let v be the velocity of this mass. It v depends on time t. We'll let f of t be a periodic force function, external force function, applied to this mass. We'll first look at a force function f of t, whose graph looks like this. Between t equals 0 and 2, it's a straight line starting at the origin and going up to uh, 2 on the vertical axis. Then our function, so this part of the graph is just f of t equals t, which is what we have right here. We're going to assume that this function is periodic with period 2. So between 2 and 4, this function's graph will look like it does over here. Between 4 and 6, this part of the graph will also look as it does over here, and so on. It keeps going on uh, towards infinity uh, periodically. We're going to consider this differential equation uh, for this spring system. The second derivative of x with respect to t plus 10x prime of t plus 24x of t equals f of t. x of t is the position of this mass at any time t. And we'll look at fairly simple initial conditions. At time 0, the position of the mass starts at 0 over here. And it also has an initial velocity of 0. So here is the graph of f of t. Let's look at this part first. Um, assume that the graph is 0 out here. And at t equals 0 right here, this is the t-axis horizontally, we're going to turn on the function that is just basically y equals t, a straight line segment of slope 1 going through the origin. And on 0 to 2, by the time we get to this end, the y value, the vertical axis value, is 2. Then at t equals 2, we need to turn this part off 
otherwise it'll continue on and we don't need that. So t equals 2, we'll turn on t minus 2, which is this graph, and we'll turn off the t graph. Then at t equals 4, we'll turn off the t minus 2 graph and turn on the t minus 4 graph. So this looks like y equals t. This is part of the graph of y equals t minus 2. This is part of the graph of y equals t minus 4. I probably should have said x equals t, x equals t minus 2, and x equals t minus 4, because we're going to be looking at a function x of t, which is the position of our mass at time t. So looking at what's going on here, we can say the following. At t equals 0, to turn on t, we just have t. Then how do we, at t equals 2, turn on t minus 2 and turn off t? We do it by this term here, plus the quantity t minus 2 minus t times the unit step function at t minus 2. At t equals 4, we want to turn on t minus 4 and turn off t minus 2. So that's going to uh, correspond to this term. The quantity t minus 4 minus t minus 2 times the unit step function evaluated at t minus 4. And we have an infinite number of more terms here for the rest of this graph going on basically forever. When we solve our problem, we're only going to have to look at part of this graph because what happens to the force function out here is not going to affect the motion of the mass at prior times. Our mass can't see the future. So now let's plot a more complicated function. Let's plot f of t, which is defined the following way. If t is between 0 and 2, f of t is t. And for other values of t, the function f is periodic with period equal to 2. Well, we saw before that we can write something like this the following way. f of t is t plus the sum, n goes from 1 to infinity, t minus 2n minus t minus 2 times n minus 1, that quantity, times the unit step function u of t minus 2n. And remember, in uh, MATLAB and in Octave, u is basically the heaviside function. So here's what we'll do for the function. Uh, function y equals f of t. Um, we'll set y equal to t. Actually, we didn't even need to do that. Uh, so let's see how we can do this. Down at the bottom of this screen, there are three tabs for Command Window, Documentation, Editor. If we click on the Editor tab, we have uh, files that are open, f.m, main2.m, main.m, and plotparabola.m. So the first thing we need to do is to go to the Command Window. Now, if I type in heavy side of, let's say, 2 comma 0 here, the unit step function evaluated at 2, hit enter. It'll tell us that the function heavy side is undefined. Uh, heavy side function belongs to the symbolic package from Octave Forge, which you should have installed but not loaded. Uh, to load the package, use load package load symbolic from the octave prompt. So down here at the prompt, let's type pkg, pkg, package, load, symbolic. Hit enter. And now it should be loaded. If I use on the keyboard the up arrow, I can go through the last commands. Let's evaluate heavy side of 2.0 again, see what happens. This time it comes back as 1. The unit step function evaluated at 2 does equal 1. So now let's go to the editor. Um, 
the main.m program is the one that we saw before. If we go over and touch, click on f.m, here is the uh, function defined which uh, we want to plot. So let's go back to main. That's where we want to start execution. Uh, we'll start execution of main. Main will call the function f, and so f will then be executed also. So let's go back up here to run. Um, save and run. Change the directory to wherever this one is. And here is our output. Let's bring it over here so we can see a little bit better. Uh, so notice that this is that function, force function f of t. This is the point zero, 00. This up here is the point uh, 2 comma 2. So this part is just the graph of t. This part is the graph of t minus 2, t minus 4, t minus 6, and so forth. So we have actually we have defined our uh, external force function, that periodic function of period two, correctly it appears. And so now we're ready to uh, use that to approximate the solution to our initial value problem. In this lesson, our goal is to approximate the solution to an initial value problem. The ordinary differential equation is a second order equation. So to do this, we need to find numerical approximations for the first derivative and for the second derivative. So first, let's look at the approximation for the first derivative. The derivative of x at t is approximately equal to x of t plus h minus x of t minus h divided by 2 times h. Let's see how this can be derived. First, we will use Taylor's theorem to expand uh, x of t plus h. x of t plus h is equal to x of t plus h times x prime of t plus h squared over 2 factorial x double prime of t plus h cubed divided by 3 factorial the third derivative of x uh, the third derivative of x with respect to t evaluated at c1 similarly and this holds for some c1 between t and uh, t plus h once again using taylor's theorem we can write x of t minus h as x of t minus h x prime of t plus h squared over 2 x double prime of t minus h cubed over 3 factorial third derivative of x evaluated at c2, where this c2 is somewhere between t minus h and t. I'm assuming here, uh, well, we can assume that h is positive. So if I subtract these two equations, let's see what happens. On the left-hand side, this uh, term and this term subtracted just give us x of t plus h minus x of t minus h. And then what happens to the right-hand side? Well, x of t minus x of t is 0. Moving on, h x prime of t minus a minus h x prime of t is 2 h x prime of t. Moving on to the next terms, h squared over 2 factorial x double prime of t minus h squared over 2 factorial x double prime of t is 0. And then moving on to these last terms, if we subtract these, we can rewrite that as h cubed over 3 factorial times x uh, triple prime at c1 plus h triple prime at c2. 
because we're taking this term minus a minus h cubed for 3 factorial times this third derivative. Now, this is the equation that we just got. Let's divide both sides of the equation by 2h. So on the left, we'll have x of t plus h minus x of t minus h divided by 2h. And then on the right-hand side, when we divide this term by 2h, we just get x prime of t. And when we divide uh, this term by 2h, instead of an h cubed, we'll have an h squared. That factor of 2 that I'm dividing by will be down here. And then uh, these two terms divided by 3 factorial. So now let's look at this term in blue. As h goes to 0, h squared over 2 goes to 0. This term is bounded because c1 and c2 are both close to um, somewhere between t minus h and t plus h. So this is a bounded term. This factor goes to 0. I should say bounded factor here. So the whole thing goes to 0 as h goes to 0. OK, uh, I notice that there is one typographical error here. Let me just mention it. Uh, this one right here should have been c2. And this one right here also should have been c2. Um, somehow I typed it wrong when we when I made this uh, slide. So in any case, what we have left is that for small h, this quotient uh, is approximately equal to h to x prime of t. So here we have our approximation of the first derivative. OK, now we come to the numerical approximation of the second derivative. The formula that we will find is the second derivative of x at t is approximately equal to x of t plus h minus 2 times x of t plus x of t minus h divided by h squared. Now, we're going to approach this the same way, a similar way, to what we did for the first derivative. We're going to use Taylor's theorem a couple of times. x of t plus h by Taylor's theorem is x of t plus h x prime of t plus h squared over 2 factorial x double prime of t plus h cubed over 3 factorial x triple prime of t plus remainder term h to the fourth over 4 factorial fourth derivative of x evaluated at c1 for some c1 between t and t plus h. Similarly, x of t minus h uh, is x of t minus h x prime of t plus h squared over 2 factorial x double prime of t minus h cubed over 3 factorial uh, x triple prime of t plus h to the fourth over 4 factorial fourth derivative of x at c2 where once again, c2 is somewhere between t minus h and t. So now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at x of t plus h minus 2x of t plus x of t minus h. So what we're going to do is we're going to add these two uh, equations together, and that'll take care of the x of t plus h and also the plus x of t minus h here. And then once we do that, we're going to subtract 2x of t from both sides. And if we do that, uh, notice we have x of t plus another x of t here when we add these two equations together. So this minus 2x of t is just getting uh, rid of these. So in that case, uh, what we're left with uh, is that x of t plus h minus 2x of t plus x of t minus h is 2 times h squared over 2 factorial x double prime of t. These two add up to 0. And these two over here add up to h to the fourth over 4 factorial, 
the fourth derivative of x at c1 plus the fourth derivative of x at c2. And then let's divide both sides of this equation by h squared. So on the left-hand side, we just get this. And on the right-hand side, uh, this h squared will disappear. And we'll just have 2 over 2 factorial, which is 1. So this whole thing divided by h squared just becomes x double prime of t. When we divide this one by h squared, that's just going to knock this power of h down by uh, 2. And we'll have h squared over 4 factorial times this sum. And now, once again, as we saw in that previous slide, uh, we have x double prime of t here, which is what we have here. This stuff over here is what we have over here. And if h is very small, then this term is going to be very small. Because as h goes to 0, h squared over 4 factorial will go to 0. This doesn't involve h at all, except in the fact that c1 and c2 are close to t. How close? This close. Okay. So as long as x has a fourth derivative, basically a continuous fourth derivative, I guess, then we have that for very small h, x double prime of t is approximately equal to this difference quotient. So notice something here. Uh, this formula involves evaluating x at three different uh, values, t plus h, t, and t minus h. Whereas the first derivative formula that we all saw before involved only evaluating the function at two uh, different values of our parameter for the function. Let's look at an example of uh, the second derivative approximation formula. Let's approximate f double prime of 2, the second derivative of f at 2, where f of x is the function uh, 3x to the fourth plus x to the fifth. So our program is, as I just said, approximate f double prime of x at x equals 2. Our MATLAB program starts with the statement clear. A command clear to clear the workspace of all variables and their values. We'll first start by letting h equal 0.1. h will be 1 tenth. Now we're going to do some stuff in a for loop. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is set x equal to 2 since I want to evaluate this at 2. Um, and in this loop, uh, we'll let df2 be our approximation of the second derivative. And by our formula, that's going to be f of x plus h minus 2 times f of x plus f of x minus h uh, divided by h squared. Then we'll f print f uh, with a tab character, h equals another tab character. And then we'll print the value of h using a percent %f format code. Then another uh, tab character, second derivative of prox equals another tab. And then the value of df2 using this conversion code for a floating point number, followed by a new line. So this line will print the value of h and df2 plus this uh, string, second derivative approximation equals. And with the tabs in there, backspace t is a tab character. Hopefully, it'll be arranged almost like a table. Then, before we go back and iterate this loop, we'll divide h by 2. h equals h by 2. Then we hit the end, and we go up here, and go through this loop a second time with k equal to 2, then 3, 4, 
and 5. The function that we're using here, f of x plus h, f of x minus h, f of x, are three calls to the function, are given down here. Function y equals f of x, y equals 3 times x to the fourth plus x to the fifth, end. Okay, so this is the entire program. Uh, this is the main program here, and it calls the function that's down here. All of this can be put in one MATLAB file and executed. When we execute that program uh, to approximate f double prime of 2 for this particular uh, function f of x, when h is a tenth the first time through the loop, the approximation of the derivative is 304.26. When we let h be 0.05, the second derivative approximation for f double prime of 2 is 304.065. When h equals 0.025, the approximation of f double prime is 304.01625. When h is 0 0.125, the approximation of the second derivative of f is 304.004063. When we half f h again, we let h in the last iteration of that for loop be 0 0.006250 and the approximation of f double prime of 2 turns out in this case to be 304.001016. Um, how close did we come to the actual value of f double prime of 2? Well, if f double prime, if f of x is this, then f double prime of x is going to be 3 times 4 times 3, which is 36, x squared, plus 5 times 4, which is 20, times x cubed. Then if we evaluate f double prime at 2, that's going to be 36 times 2 squared, which is 4, plus 20 times 2 cubed, which is 20 times 8. That's 144 plus 160 which adds up to 304. And as we can see, as we let h get smaller and smaller, uh, these values over here for our approximation got closer and closer to 304. Now, if you pick h to be very, 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 very small, uh, this approximation might blow up because we're dividing by 2h uh, sorry, we're dividing by h squared in our approximation, numerical approximation formula, and numerical errors can occur due to the finite word size that we're using for storing these numbers. Uh, computers don't have infinite accuracy. They have finite word sizes, and those uh, will give us some error. Also, the fact that there was an error term involving h square would also give us some error, uh, which we can see included here. So it's approximate, but we can see that in this particular case, it was quite good. Here is the MATLAB program that we just talked about um, with a comment in here that we're going to approximate f double prime of x at x equals 2. Here is the code that we saw for our main program and in the same file uh, we have this function defined after the code for the main program. Um, I'm calling this one, I guess, main, this file is main diff 2m So what we want to do now is to, uh, first let's look at the command window for a minute. I think I cleared it. Yes, it's cleared. 
So let's go back to the editor window and we'll execute this program. So I'll come up to run, click on that, uh, save file and execute. And now let's see what happened. There we go. Uh, here is our output from executing the code in that file main diff2. Uh, we can see that uh, starting with h equal to 0.1 and each successive value of h is just one half of the previous value. The second derivative approximations of f double prime of 2 as we noted earlier were these numbers which were getting closer and closer to 304 which was the actual exact value of the second derivative of f at 2. So now we want to change our initial value problem which involves a continuous function x of t into a discrete problem using arrays. So first of all, let's consider the function x of t that we're looking at. Uh, we know that x double prime of t plus 10x prime of t plus 24x of t equals f of t is the differential equation we want to solve. So for x double prime of t, let's substitute in that numerical approximation of the second derivative. We'll assume that h is some small number. For x of t here, we will substitute in its approximation numerically, which is here. For this x of t, we'll just leave x of t there. And for f of t on the other side, we'll still have f of t. Okay, so this gives us an equation involving x of t plus h, x of t, and x of t minus h. We can multiply this equation through by 2h squared. That's the common denominator for these two fractions. And when we collect like terms, we can write it as the quantity 2 plus 10h times x of t plus h plus 4 minus 48h squared times x of t plus 2 minus 10h times x of t minus h equals, and then on the right-hand side of the equation, 2h squared times f of t. Now, let's solve this equation for x of t plus h in terms of everything else. So we'll basically uh, subtract these terms right here from both sides of the equation, and then we'll divide uh, the resulting equation by 2 plus 10h. When we do that, we get x of t plus h equals 1 over 2 plus 10 times h times 2h squared f of t minus 4 minus 48h uh, squared x of t minus 2 minus 10h x of t minus h. Now, if we look at this, this is kind of nice because if we know the value of x of t minus h, and x of t, and we know what the function f is, then we can compute x of t plus h. So we can think of the problem now as being discrete, where we look at uh, only particular points in time, um, and we'll see what we're going to do right now. So this is the same equation that we had up here, and here's what I'm going to do. Uh, let x of point minus point zero one equals zero. This is x of t evaluated at this value of t. Let's also let x of zero be zero. Well, why would we do this? Well, first of all, x of zero equals zero was one of our initial conditions in our initial value problem. But now we want x prime of zero, an initial condition, to equal zero also. But x prime of 0 can be approximated by x of 0 minus x of minus 0 0.01 divided by 0 0.01. And if we want this thing to be 0, that means that this numerator is going to have to be 0. 
So x of minus 0 0.01 has to equal x of 0, but x of 0 is 0. So that forces, by our second initial condition, x of minus 0 0.01 to be 0 also. So now we have everything written in terms of basically x at some uh, discrete values of t. Minus 0 0.01, 0. Then if I let h be 0 0.01 as I did going from here to here, I can also evaluate x at 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, and so on. We can basically use this equation to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. As I said before, if we know x of t and x of t minus h, we can go forward to find out approximately at least what x of t plus h is. But remember, this is not an exact calculation solution of the differential equation because we were numerically approximating these derivatives. So this equation is approximate. So now we'll do a similar approximation using arrays. Uh, here's the equation that we had for x of t plus h from the previous slide. So I'm going to define a sequence of real numbers, basically t values. t sub 1, t sub 2, t sub 3, t sub 4, t sub 5, t sub 6, all the way up to maybe t sub 801. Uh, t sub 1 will be the t value minus 0 0.01. t sub 2 will be 0. t sub 3 will be 0 0.01. t sub 4 is 0 0.02. t sub 5 would be 0 0.03, and so on. Okay, so to implement this scheme, as I just said, t sub 1 will be minus 0 0.01, t sub 2 will be 0. And for other values of k, like k equals 3, 4, 5, and so forth, t sub k will be minus 0 0.01 plus k minus 1 times 1 one hundredth. This 1 one hundredth is the spacing between two of these t values up here. Uh, as we kind of did on the previous slide, we'll let x sub 1 be 0, x sub 2 be 0. And by this formula up here, x sub k plus 1 will be 1 over 2 plus 10h times 2h squared times f of t sub k plus 4 minus 48h squared times x sub k plus 10 minus 2, 10h minus 2. Just change the sign and multiply this by minus 1 to get this times uh, and this will turn into x sub k minus 1. So here we have the values of x sub 1 and x sub 2 given. Those were approximate values of x of t at these values of t sub 1 and t sub 2. And this formula basically, uh, I guess you can say, is a uh, recurrence relation. We can get x sub k plus 1 in terms of the previous values in the sequence of x sub k's. And this is something that we can program in MATLAB. We can use these equations right here and this one up here to uh, solve for the x sub k's, which will be an approximation to the solution to the initial value problem uh, that we had earlier. So here's a MATLAB program for 
uh, numerically solving that initial value problem. Here's the main program, and here's the step function uh, that we defined before. So I clear the workspace. All variables are now gone. I'm going to let the number of points be 802. I'm going to let h be 8 divided by the number of points. Basically, I want to divide the t interval from 0 to 8 up into uh, 100 little subintervals. Since I'm actually going to start with t equals minus 0 0.01, I made it just a little bit bigger than 800 here. Okay, so let's see. So t sub 1 then is going to be minus 0 0.01. Uh, x sub 1 will be 0, t sub 2 will be 0, x sub 2 will be 0. Uh, this, these first two just say that x is 0 when t equals uh, minus 0 0.01. These two over here say that x is equal to 0 when t is equal to 0. And then we start a large for loop for k going from 2 to num points, which was 802 up here. t sub k plus 1 is just going to be minus 0.01, the starting point, plus k minus 1 times 1 one hundredth. And then x sub k plus 1 is given by that recursion formula that we saw on the previous transparency, and then end. So this for loop uh, iterates many times k equals 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way up through uh, 802. And then after that, we will plot t on the horizontal axis versus x on the vertical axis. Uh, and to make the curve uh, stand out a little bit better, I'm going to make the width of the curve uh, equal to 3 units, line width in quotation marks, comma, 3. Our function over here is just the piecewise continuous function that we had seen earlier. Uh, and it's basically the same sort of code that we saw earlier too. So we're now ready to run this program and see what happens. So here's the program that we just looked at, the main program, where we clear the workspace of all variables, set the number of points to 802, set the interval or increment length to 8 over number of points, because we're going to look at a t interval going from 0 to 8, uh, set t sub 1 to 0 0.01, x sub 1 to 0, t sub 2 to 0, x sub 2 to 0, we saw why that was true. And then in this loop, we define all of the succeeding values of the array t, and also the succeeding values of our function x of t. And after about 800 times iterating through this loop, this loop ends, and then we plot t versus x with the line width equal to 3, just to make the graph curve a little bit thicker so that it's easy to see. This is stored in the file main.m. f.m is uh, a function file which defines basically that uh, piecewise force function that we looked at in our spring problem. Um, the file name is f.m. The function name is f. The file name and the function name have to be the same so that MATLAB can find this function. So now let's go back to the main program. Uh, let's run it and see what happens. And here's our curve. Uh, if you remember the Sage Math curve that we got earlier, this much this looks very much like that curve, and it should. Uh, the Sage Math curve was in a sense more accurate because we analytically solved the initial value problem 
to find the solution function, and then we plotted that solution function. We knew what the solution function was. In this case, uh, using MATLAB and numerical methods, we don't have a formula, a nice formula, for the solution function, but we were able to approximate the points on its graph, and so we still know what the solution looks like. And for many uh, purposes, this might be enough. So now, let's look at two plots of our solution function. On the left, we have the plot uh, that we got earlier from Sage Math, and on the right, we have the plot that was from MATLAB. The Sage Math uh, plot over here we saw in the previous lesson. We solved the problem uh, analytically by using Laplace transforms and inverse Laplace transforms. If we look at this graph, uh, it starts at 0, 0 here. It goes up to a peak of what? Uh, 0.07 would be up here, I guess. So it's 0.06 something. Then it goes down, up, down, and so forth. Uh, on this graph, t went from 0 to 10. Our numerical approximation of the solution uh, goes basically from 0 to 8. So I used uh, a different range of values for these two graphs, but still similar enough that we can uh, compare them. Notice that on this graph, the peak is also at 0 0.06 something. Looks like maybe about 0 0.065, perhaps. Um, this graph ends at t equals 8, with this point up here. For comparison, I marked t equals 8 here, and so we can see that uh, in this curve, we have 1, 2, 3, and we're going up to the fourth peak over here, 1, 2, 3, and we're going up to the fourth peak peak here too. This one, it looks like we got very close perhaps to the peak. This one, it looks like it needs to go up just a little bit further before it starts back down. So there's a little bit of discrepancy there. That's not surprising because this is a graph of the exact solution as Sage Math would portray it. And this is a graph of the approximate solution that we got by numerical methods. So we should be pleased that these two curves, one curve found by using Laplace transforms and their inverses, and this other curve just by numerical approximation of derivatives turned out to be so alike. Both methods did a pretty good job of giving us a fairly accurate graph of the solution to our initial value problem involving that spring hooked to a mass, and the mass had a periodic uh, external force function. What did we do in this lesson? Let us summarize. Uh, we found formulas for approximating the first and second derivatives of a function x of t, numerical formulas. Uh, the first derivative approximation used two values of the function, x of t minus h and x of t plus h, where h is a small number. The second derivative approximation used three values of the function, x of t minus h, x of t, and x of t plus h. We used these two approximations to transform the differential equation into a finite difference equation and we use the values of the initial elements of the array x sub k to be similar to the initial conditions that were given by the initial value problem. I hope you enjoyed this lesson, and hopefully you can continue and watch more of these as time goes on. Have a good day. I would like to thank you for watching this video. I hope you have found it to be an enjoyable learning experience. If you're interested in ordinary differential equations, there are additional videos in this series covering most of the topics in an introductory course in ODEs. 
Have a good day.